What's going on, fellas? What you just watched there was some of my training from today. Uh, very good, productive, uh, upper body centric session. Uh, hit some good, strict overhead pressing. Knee uh, is feeling really good, so I can start getting back into my uh, push pressing practicing there. Uh, make sure that I'm not just the strict press guy. I'm a, when I show up to a strongman contest, I know how to use my legs because uh, I'd say it's rather embarrassing to be the guy that uh, has really amateurish leg drive. I don't want that to be me. So we're going to get back to practice now that the knee is feeling pretty good. Uh, hit a bunch of pull-ups, um, pretty heavy today. Really working on those just to build up that general upper body pulling musculature because uh, looking across the board, a lot of the events that I'm not that good at are uh, ones that, yeah, they're specific skills that I haven't had the opportunity to work on due to a lack of equipment, but also there's a lot of overlap in the musculature demands of the events that I'm not so good at. Things like sandbags, things like kegs, things like uh, stone all use this upper body pulling musculature. So uh, I felt that was a bit of a hole in my development that I chose to fill up. And then what you just watched there uh, was my heavy set of dips from today where I did my body weight, which is 260, uh, plus five plates, which is 225 uh, for a set of six. This actually beats my old best when I trained dips way back in the day in my college gym when I was lighter. I think I hit 225 for four. So today was pretty comfortable. Didn't feel like a all out effort. Going to keep building those up for fun. Just hit some extra heavy tricep work. Couldn't really hurt. Uh, been enjoying those. Going to keep pushing those. Hopefully going to hit some uh, really heavy stuff on the dips kind of soon. But that's the check-in for where we're at. I got to do my mobility tonight because I've got some heavy squats tomorrow. i uh, got some light technique focused deadlifts tomorrow. A little leg workout to drive some blood flow, keep my knees feeling good. Um, later in the week, we got some pretty heavy pulls to get into. So lots of fun stuff on the docket. I'll keep throwing those at the beginning of the video for those of you guys that like to keep up with what I'm doing. Uh, but let's get into the video. So today we're going to do nothing but controversial lifting opinions. As always, we're giving out the coveted hot take award, which means it's got to be controversial among people that actually know what they're talking about. And I got to agree with you. I'm pretty stingy with giving them out. So uh, no offense if I don't give you the coveted hot take medal, but we're going to get into your guys' lifting related opinions and I'm going to let you know what I think of them. You guys left me a lot of really wordy ones. So you're going to have to bear with me because I can barely read. And that's not a joke. Uh, so first one is from Paris himself. Of course, when Paris leaves, leaves a comment, it gets the most likes, so it goes right to the top. Uh, first one is, this might not be a hot take, but I feel some level of general leg isolation is universally productive, whether that be in the form of hamstring curls, adduction, uh, or leg extension slash sissy squats. It's a great habit to pick up uh, your low-hanging fruits. Um, I don't know. I have a hard time getting behind anything that says universally productive, regardless of training goal, right? Um, I'm a big believer that, yeah, somewhere in our program, we should probably challenge knee flexion, right? The uh, short head of our hamstring isn't going to be hit on ham like hip hinging movements because it does not tie across the hip. It only ties across the knee. And I would rather not have this uh, bit of major musculature very underprepared. Uh, that seems to me like I'm begging for injury. And one of the few things that we do have some formal evidence to support is something like a Nordic curl uh, reducing the rate of hamstring strains. Um, is that unique to a Nordic curl? Does the Nordic curl, because you're moving your body weight, does that magically make it do something that other knee flexion doesn't? No, it's probably that exposing that area to resistance training in these loading profiles increases that tissue tolerance in the area, right? So it's probably something you could get out of a hamstring curl. It's probably something you could get out of glute ham raise. Um, it's not unique to Nordic curls probably, but it is something I like to see in programs. So probably I would say, yeah, whether the goal is bodybuilding, whether the goal is powerlifting, or whether the goal is performance, I like to see some knee flexion flexion based work. It's not taxing on the low back. So it can just run up some extra volume, uh, during our sessions, which is usually a good idea. Um, it's only going to help the deadlift to have bigger hamstrings. Even if we don't see direct carryover because the function we're training is not the same function that they're contributing to in the deadlift, in the long run, the guy with the bigger hamstrings is probably going to have a little bit easier time uh, continuing to progress his uh, deadlift. So yeah, it might not make a difference one training cycle from now, but I do believe that logging your work on the hamstring curl after you finish deadlifting is probably a worthwhile endeavor. And even a lot of high specificity powerlifters, you can see them do these little lift specific hypertrophy workouts uh, after their training sessions and, you know, a lot of them will have hamstring curls after deadlift. So um, I can kind of get behind the hamstring curl. I'm a big fan of the direct adductor training. There's tons of good athletes that don't. If the goal is leg size, 
I'm with you on this one, Paris. I think that people are missing out if they're not training their adductor. It's a huge muscle that really contributes to not just the illusion, but the reality of very big legs. Uh, and especially if you're someone who does not, that's not a genetic strong suit and you're really having to dig deep to get impressive legs, you'd be a fool to not pick up that relatively low hanging fruit of hypertrophying a major part of it. Um, kind of the same thing is if someone's really struggling to grow their arms, we're gonna look to kind of leverage anything we can. Same thing with the calves. Um, while, you know, maybe I will say, a bunch of people will say, hey, uh, things with the knee relatively straight are gonna target the gastroc. The gastroc's a bigger, bigger muscle. If we're bodybuilding, we should probably do things with a straight knee um, because it's gonna be a better bang for the buck in terms of the size of our calf. If someone's really struggling and that's not a genetic strong suit of theirs, they're probably gonna want to do also knee flexion-based calf extension or like calf raises to bias the soleus because they're trying to hypertrophy anything in that area and or do anything they can to get this this big calf. It's not the illusion of big calves, but in reality, big calves. So um, I would say the same thing could apply to legs. Um, it's also pretty good for injury risk reduction, in my opinion, to train the adductor in a lengthened position, whether that be a Kazakh squat or an adductor machine or something to like. Um, leg extensions, mm, I mean, they are low hanging, low hanging fruit, but I wouldn't say it's universally kind of needed. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would say it's not unreasonable. Probably spent too long on that first one. Hopefully, I'm not setting a precedent for this to be a too long, two hour long video. Uh, Paris, long one, but here we go. As someone that is experienced with both strength and hypertrophy training, I believe the difference between the two is notable yet overstated. Uh, I think if we. I think we can reasonably say it's 100% quicker to train purely for hypertrophy uh, with compound slash isolation lifts with a good stimulus to fatigue ratio, while also acknowledging that we can do these same lifts to a lesser extent on a strength program. Uh, so he's saying that just because we're doing a strength program doesn't mean that we have to use these strength bias techniques like arching into bench press, taking the grip out, moving the bar lower on our back for a squat, which are going to be uh, productive for the uh, pure numerical side of things, but we can use the greater range of motion lifts in a strength training context. And some of the detriments and some of the critiques people will make uh, of strength training would then go away. People say, oh, well, a powerlifting bench press is not productive. Um, it's less productive, it's not not productive, but we could train for strength on a close grip Larson press. We could train for strength with a high bar. Um, someone in the replies made a good point, which is this is just largely because powerlifting is such an accessible strength sport and you can do it at nearly any gym. Uh, powerlifting has become synonymous with strength training, when in reality, powerlifting is just one form of strength training. We can engage in strength training with all of these lifts uh, that may be biased towards the muscles that we're trying to get stronger or whatever, like high bar squats, like closer grip bench presses with minimal arches, maybe conventional deadlifts or RDLs or stiff legs. All of these things could still be applied to um, strength training. So the motions themselves is more a critique of powerlifting training than it is a critique of uh, strength training. Sure, I'm with you there. Uh, if we take compound lifts through a big range of motion, pecs, legs, shoulders, and back will cover will be covered for the most part hypertrophy wise. Uh, you don't have as much training economy to build up smaller muscles as quickly, uh, but all the same, you can definitely get very jacked on a strength training program that is well written. A guy that trains optimally for hypertrophy will 100% be notably bigger than the guy that trains for strength uh, if they both are at the same level. But so many hypertrophy focused guys train like shit. Uh, example, some of the hot takes on my Instagram polls are bad. I've seen Paris's Instagram polls. Some of the takes are horrendous. I can vouch for that. Um, so not, not to slight them, but this is just the exact example of the average trainee. So the extra training economy isn't being utilized. So comparatively, they would be absolutely more jacked following a good strength training program. Uh, I have more thoughts, but they aren't fully formed yet. Those are the major comp like components. Um, I get what you're saying, right? So we're saying that, hey, um, yeah, absolutely. If hypertrophy is the goal, the training should reflect that. The training should be hypertrophy oriented. But that being said, we could set up our strength training in such a way that it's achieving the result of hypertrophy pretty well. We're leaving a little bit on the table, but most people are doing the process so poorly that the optimization of their training economy is probably like making sure that 100%, let's just say, uh, we got a we got a blend. Let's say seventy five percent of our training is probably in rep ranges that are not so relevant to hypertrophy. We're more training those neural and skill qualities of our strength training, and then seventy five percent of it is dedicated to hypertrophy relevant tr uh, training. I think Paris's point here is that. 
somebody who's doing 75% of their training economy dedicated to hypertrophy, but doing it well is going to outperform the guys that are doing 100% of it dedicated to hypertrophy, but doing it very badly. And thus, we shouldn't necessarily bash strength training for its lack of efficiency uh, before we look at all these other things first, because a lot of people, their goal isn't to have the absolute best physique they can. They just want to have a good physique. And um, there's a little bit of fear mongering maybe about strength training being not productive for that, but it really comes down to what that strength training looks like, right? If we do this hyper-specific low volume SBD program with uh, sumo pulls, big arch bench presses, and uh, very low bar squats, yes, it's probably going to leave a, leave you woefully uh, shy of your goals hypertrophy wise, but uh, that isn't synonymous with strength training. I get what Paris is getting at here. Um, I think it's a reasonable point. Um, I think you phrased that in such a way I don't think a lot of people would disagree with that. So no hot take award for you. Uh, the next one, conjugate, makes the most sense compared to other programs. Okay, well, bold ass claim. Uh, you're maxing out a bunch of different variations of elliptic. It's stronger at different angles and build the neurological part of strength. Well, the neurological part of strength is specific to the task, right? So this idea of building something from different angles if we're trying to get more neurologically efficient in the movement, we should do that movement itself. Now, I'm a big fan of some variation, driving some uh, new adaptation via this novel stimulus. But that being said, I don't think that it's best suited for those neural adaptations necessarily if we have a specific goal. Uh, the other part is increased muscle size, which is covered through accessory work. Um, I don't think that's a plus of conjugate. I think just about any coherent strength training program incorporates accessory work for uh, hypertrophy relevant rep ranges to build relevant muscles. I really haven't come across a methodology that doesn't uh, kind of get after that to some degree past just like starting strength. Um, sticking between the 10 to 20 sets per week for hypertrophy allows you to almost maximize strength uh, and hypertrophy year round. So it's adaptable to any sport uh, just by changing the weak point focus. I don't agree with you at all here. If we're doing 20 sets per week of hypertrophy or 10 to 20, by default, that's gonna cut into our ability to do the strength training and vice versa. Doing these maximal effort lifts multiple times per week is gonna cut into our ability to do as much productive hypertrophy uh, as possible. Can we do a reasonably good job at both at the same time? Sure, I think if we have good variable management in place, good fatigue management strategies in place, it could be done. Uh, but that being said, we're not gonna be 99% optimal on both. We're probably gonna be a good deviation away from that. Uh, um, some people go so far as to say, like, though he who chases two rabbits catches neither. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think practically uh, physical qualities can be developed at the same time. I'm just a big fan of when we have periods of training where we place a little bit more emphasis towards another. We're not like in a hypertrophy phase. We're still looking at our strength as a develop, like a physical quality that we're trying to develop, but we're shifting the emphasis towards hypertrophy or during a peaking phase, uh, assuming it's a training peak or a strength, let's just go ahead and say a strength phase. Um, we're still looking to hypertrophy relevant muscles because it's a very good way to get stronger. We're just shifting a little bit more of our training economy in one direction to get away from this idea of, well, trying to do both maximally at the same time is going to lead to you doing a less good job of both. Um, can conjugate be done well? Sure. Um, I think that a lot of the problems with conjugate, actually, a lot of it stems from the exercise selection that comes along with conjugate influences being heavily biased towards equipped lifting. And all of this is focused on the top end strength, but in reality, raw lifters are probably needing to focus on strength of the bottom half of the ROM. And if we switch that up and we make our variation a little bit more specific so we can be developing these skill qualities a little bit more, maybe make the speed work a little bit heavier for raw lifting where we aren't benching a thousand pounds. Um, and then it just gets into submax work, but that's a, that's a different thing to talk about. Um, I do understand what you're saying for sports that it can scale. I wouldn't say it's conjugate specifically that scales well for sports, but a little bit more of a concurrent approach. I can see how that scales to sports pretty well, but when we're talking strength sports, I don't necessarily agree with you. I think a more periodized approach has outperformed conjugate. That's pretty clear to see in the high performers. Will Rattel has some good stuff about concurrent uh, being a good idea for like field sports athletes. And I can kind of get behind this idea of, okay, this idea of concrete periodization gets a little bit more metal, like muddy, right? We're still periodizing because we have an in-season, we have a post, like we've got an off-season, we've got a pre-season. So there's some kind of periodization there, but the idea that we're um, training for all physical qualities a little bit more at the same time with a little bit of biasing between them, for sure, I get that. Uh, but I do not agree with you. Now, here's one that is interesting. Bodybuilding is more practical for sports training than powerlifting, Olympic lifting, or quote unquote functional training, 
as long as one is also properly practicing their sport. And that's a good note, right? Uh, a lot of people will say, hey, we don't need to mirror what we're doing on the field uh, in the weight room because we're already doing that in the field in pretty big quantities. If we're doing enough to get better at our sport on the field, we're already addressing whatever physical qualities are uh, pretty hyper-specific. We don't need to mirror everything we're doing on the field in the weight room. We're looking more to develop general physical qualities um, and durability in the weight room, not necessarily be hyper-specific. And that's where um, we can get into this a little bit. He says, bigger muscles, healthier joints, lots of physical potential, uh, lots of strength potential anyway, uh, con like conditions, connective tissue, plus non-specific proprioception, especially for smaller muscles. Now, I see what you're saying, right? And there's a very good underlying point here that I've seen a lot of people raising in recent times, and that's, hey, uh, body, like, we, if we're doing a, like, if a athlete is training, not everything needs to look like this ultra-functional movement. Sometimes just general resistance training, just general bodybuilding training, uh, fills some of those needs. And you can see, um, I think somebody in the comments mentioned, oh, Gordon Ryan seems to just do a bro split, and he's just kind of exposing himself to resistance training and a bunch of different movements, and that seems to get the job done for him. Well, just because something works for a high performer doesn't mean it's going to pass the test of being the perfect plan. But that being said, I do think that's a reasonable point that not everything an athlete needs to do needs to look like this ultra functional thing or needs to look exactly like what they do on the field. We're, we're trying to just select exercises, good, good stimulus to fatigue ratio uh, that are building up the general qualities we're looking for, not necessarily always the specific qualities. That's for the more specific areas. But that being said, all of the pros that you have raised uh, for body bodybuilding training could be achieved with functional training. I know you're using that as like a bit of a knock on it, but some people do it well, right? Uh, we can absolutely achieve bigger muscles using a little bit more varied training. It doesn't need to be bodybuilding training. We can absolutely achieve the healthier joints. I would argue that's going to come from just about any resistance training. Maybe it could be a little bit better or a little bit worse, but that's going to be achieved by all three of the things you listed. Lots of strength potential. Again, quote unquote functional training can build plenty of strength potential, uh, conditioning, connective tissue. Again, that's kind of inherent to resistance training. Um, if the, whether our loading profile is more traditional looking bodybuilding movements or maybe more traditional, maybe a little bit more athletic movements if we want to call them that, plus great non-specific proprioception, especially in smaller muscles. Now, I understand the benefits of proprioception, but I'm not sure establishing mind-muscle connections with small muscles is the kind of proprioception that's very relevant to an athlete. I think bodily awareness and the ability to move the body through space is very important. And yes, that will be built to some degree in bodybuilding, but also in this quote-unquote functional training where maybe we're using something to be stereotypically thrown at an athlete, like a sled. That's going to do all of these things. It's going to build bigger muscles. It's going to build better, stronger connective tissue. It's going to build proprioceptive awareness. So I would say a blend between the two. I think you've got a very strong underlying point here, which is that it doesn't need to look like exclusively functional movements to be a very effective and relatively simple approach to a strength, uh, athlete's strength training program. Um, but that being said, I don't think that the functional movements are inherently bad or worse. I would probably expect the training of a good athlete to look like a bit of both. Um, that would be my thoughts. No hot take award. Uh, this is already pretty long. Um, so I think we will do two more. Paris says, with a bunch of likes, bodybuilding as a culture is a lot less welcoming than strength sports, especially considering some overbearing internet interactions I've had with weightlifters, even considering some overbearing internet interactions I've had with some weightlifters, bodybuilding seems a lot more toxic overall. Faz lifts agreeing, uh, someone who's been a little bit more in the bodybuilding competitive space says the only time he's had a really negative interaction was backstage of a men's physique show, whereas every powerlifting meet he's done uh, has been quite positive. I'll take Faz's, uh, I'll take his account for that uh, as probably my my take. I haven't been around bodybuilding much, whether that be the online space or the competitive space, so I can't really say, but I can back what Faz said. Every powerlifting meet, every strongman contest I have entered is a pretty uniquely supportive environment. I think the you versus you trying to improve your total uh, or trying to perform well, you versus the weight or you versus the implemented strongman uh, thing makes it a little bit different than something like bodybuilding, which is going to be a direct comparison between bodies. And there is no objective uh, you versus you component, though I absolutely see there could be comparisons to try and improve yourself over time. The competitive side of the sport is a lot more competitive. And also I think that subjectivity is something that people can hide behind and be delusional and be a little bit angrier. But this is all speculative as a guy in the strength training side. So I have no idea. I don't know that much about uh, the bodybuilding space, be that online or competitively. But uh, intuitively, that makes sense to me. 
Um, Training to failure is often necessary to gauge where you're at strength-wise, overall, fitness-wise, uh, and feel how many reps you have truly have in reserve. So let's go through those backwards. To test how many reps you have in reserve, absolutely. You've probably heard me on this channel call that like an RPE audit. So maybe we hit three sets of like RPE seven, three reps in reserve, take the last one to failure. If it's a motion, it's probably a good idea to do so on and really give ourselves a reality check on whether those first three sets were in the ballpark of RPE seven or were we sandbagging and we need to recalibrate next time. So these RPE audits are something that I think most people need to do. Uh, gauging RIR is a skill that we need to develop over time. And these audits help us recalibrate on each exercise what a two RIR feels like, what an one RIR feels like, because some things just feel hard as shit uh, just by the, their nature. Something like an SSB squat, the RPE always feels like three higher than what it would feel like on a straight bar, even though the same number of reps are in the tank. Um, so yeah, I would say for sure, feel how many reps you have in the tank. I see what you're saying there. Overall fitness wise, I don't think I need to rep something out to gauge uh, that. If I'm seeing progress, I'm seeing progress. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. Depends if it's like a sport related fitness, you know, if we're preparing for, um, a strongman contest where we're taking something for max reps, I probably wouldn't do a full effort rep out in my preparation. Um, maybe once, but I don't necessarily need to gauge exactly where I'm at. What I'm looking for is forward progression from week to week in my condition, preparing for that rep out. Um, so, and then see where you're at strength wise. Okay, I can see that as an audit of making sure that we're progressing to make sure that what we're doing uh, is kind of the do the doses are correct. The amount of frequency, volume, intensity is, is moving us in the right direction. We don't necessarily always want to wait till the end of a training cycle to see if what we did was a good idea. We might want to have check-ins through the uh, block and doing a rep out at a weight is a good way for these check-ins to take place while still also building more momentum. Uh, so yeah, something like a rep out could be used as a little audit to make sure that our training is appropriate. That being said, we probably should be able to gauge our forward momentum without necessarily having to do a rep out, but that is something I'll use, so I can't tell you you're wrong. Um, yeah, mixed bag. Um, last one. If you train for general strength, not powerlifting, there's no need to do conventional deadlifts. Strong legs and posterior chain can be built with squats and other hinge variations. Um, no hot take award for you. You're 100% correct. You don't need to do anything. If you're not training for any specific sport, there is no specificity. You don't need to squat. You could build leg strength with split squats and hack squats. You don't need to do anything. Um, I don't think that's in, like I don't think that's a unique phenomenon to the conventional deadlift. Now, if you were saying you should not, I mean, that's tricky because when we say train for general strength, people are going to define their metrics of general strength differently, right? If I define my conventional deadlift from the floor as a measure I look at of my general strength, then I should probably do it. If I say I don't really care, um, I use my stiff leg as my proxy for posterior chain strength. Okay, yeah, you don't need to do conventional pulls. Um, but I would say that's nothing unique to the conventional deadlift. I think that exact same rationale could be applied to every single exercise. So it's not necessarily like a unique observation. So no hot take medal awarded. All right, we're going to do one last one. Uh, this is from Nate Esker, big Nate Strong on Instagram, big strong guy, probably worth a follow. Uh, seems like a very nice guy as well. I like that guy. He says, training every day in some way is possible and effective if set up right, even for bigger, stronger lifters. Now, when I read this initially, I thought maybe this was going to be my pet peeve because I will get these hot takes from people that are very new in their lifting. And there's nothing wrong with that. We were all new at one point um, where they basically tell me that they've come up with a paradigm shift. And that everybody stronger than them would be much stronger if they use their paradigm shift in how they structure their training. And uh, it always it's always a m little mixed bag of depending on how they present it to me. Because some guys present it to me so arrogantly. It's crazy. They're just like, yeah, all those guys that are uh, squatting a 1,000 pounds, they'd be much stronger if they squatted twice a week because, uh, because uh, who was it? Oh, Paul Carter says so. Those always wind me up a little bit. Oh, they could recover. They're just out of shape. You know, the, the absolute intensity doesn't matter. That was one, if you've uh, been following the channel, that one wound me up a little bit. But people will send me these paradigm shifts. And it's always a little frustrating because it seems like you're not giving any credit to those who have been doing it longer. You think they haven't come up with that idea and you think they haven't tried it. Nobody's tried it. Because if somebody tried it and they were outperforming their peers, you'd see that pretty quickly spread across all of the high performers. It's not that nobody is uh, not nobody. It's not that nobody has tried it. It's that people have tried it and it didn't work most of the time. 
So I was like, oh shit, this is going to be one of those paradigm shift guys, even for big strong guys. But then I read the name and I was like, it's a big strong guy. Okay, fair enough. Uh, not that I would discount someone's opinion just because they're not strong. I think ideas should be looked at based on the merit of the idea, but a lot of that is one of my pet peeves. And so I was like, okay. Uh, at first I was like, yeah, nah, you can't really train every day. And I was like, I'm thinking of resistance training every day, which I'm not a huge fan of. I've tried it many, many times. And could it be set up effectively? Sure, absolutely. You could finesse things if you're hell bent on it, but I don't think it's going to be optimal for the vast majority of people, especially given that a lot of people's variable, variable management is not great. If we are not really consistent with our sleep, really consistent with our food intake, we probably should have days off of resistance training. But he says train every day in some way, in which case we're just trying to improve some physical qualities of our body, some kind of physical training, and that encompasses conditioning as well. And in which case I would say absolutely you can train your body, you can engage in exercise every day as long as we structure it well. I do steady state cardio every single day uh, that I, well, every single day, and I do extra on the days that I have no resistance training. So in that regard, I am training in some way uh, every single day. And I find that I recover a hell of a lot better from that general movement, from that blood flow, and from that greater aerobic base that is built up by this habitual uh, doing of uh, aerobic training, right? So I would say, yeah, I agree. I would say probably hits the criteria for controversial. I think a lot of people are so scared of overdoing it that a lot of people would knee-jerk disagree with that. I think if you presented to them the idea that, okay, well, we're addressing conditioning, not resistance training, we're giving our soft, our soft tissue uh, probably time to heal as long as we're selecting the right means of conditioning that aren't uh, taxing on the joints. Um, I think a lot of people might agree, but based on the initial thing, we'll give a hot take medal because I like Big Nate. So there you go. Thank you guys for watching my video. I appreciate you boys. We're going to keep making more of these.